Hello and welcome back to all the young activists, students, and leaders across the globe. My name is Sahar Mohammed Zeta, and I'm a 20-year-old young explorer at the National Geographic Society, and I'm a student at Harvard. This is our fourth session of Gen Geo Careers and Exploration, which is part of our summer learning series. It's brought to you by young people for young people. And this series emphasizes National Geographic's belief that you and me, Gen Geo, we're the key to addressing the world's most pressing problems. So you and I are part of a creative and innovative generation that approaches challenges differently. And I know that a lot of us are itching to get out into the world and make a positive impact, especially now. But you may be wondering, how do I convert my passion into a career? You know, how do I take what I'm interested in and make it a sustainable endeavor? Well, my friends, you're in the right place. To help you continue on your journey to change the world, I'll be sharing a behind the scenes look at all the inspiring careers and individuals who bring National Geographic's mission to life. So no matter where you are in your career, your studies, your educational journey, you have the chance to learn firsthand from National Geographic's very own experts every single week. So what are you waiting for? Just mark your calendars and tune in live every single Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So over the past couple of weeks, we've spoken with incredible people from around the world. We have scientists, mountaineers, educators, but this week specifically, I am thrilled to be joined by a fellow young person. Gab Mejia is an internationally renowned photographer. And I mean, he's traveled and covered stories on nature from the receding glaciers of Patagonia um, to the wetlands, the critically endangered dwarf buffaloes for the worldwide fund for nature. And on top of all of that, he is an avid adventurer and mountaineer. He's scaled mountains across different continents from North Africa all the way to the Himalayas in South America. And if that isn't enough, he also works part-time for the National Youth Council of the Philippines to educate and empower youth to protect and conserve wetlands and mountain ecosystems through the art of visual storytelling. He's also a Nikon ambassador for the Philippines and has presented stories as a TEDx speaker. And to top it all off, Gab is currently pursuing a civil engineering degree in the University of Philippines as he aspires to be an environmental engineer. So Gab, Welcome, it is so nice to have you. Hey, Shar, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm just really grateful and honored to be here for the Gen Geo series, and I'm just so excited. Oh, absolutely. Um, and Gab, I had the chance to meet you earlier, this time last year at the National Geographic Explorers Festival. So I'm thrilled that we're reconnecting, even though it has to be virtual. Um, among <laughs> other things, I've learned from you, one of them is that 24 hours in a day is apparently plenty. I mean, I'm just astounded by all the work you've accomplished in such a short amount of time. Um, if you don't mind, you know, I'd love to start off this session and by starting a conversation and to learn a little bit more about your story, what you're currently doing and everything in between. Yeah, so actually I'm Gab, so I'm from the Philippines and I'm 23 years old. And before everything else, before all the things that I've been working on from for National Geographic, for Worldwide Fund for Nature and everything, I, I actually did not know what I wanted to do when I was young, very young. And it's only now that I actually realize this. So I'll actually share it now. Yeah, so this is the Philippines, actually. This is my country, and these are the mountains that I grew up in and traveled in when I was younger. And, you know, the Philippines is an archipelago, archipelagic country or in an archipelago with 7,000 islands. So I grew up like going to the beach, going hiking up in volcanoes and the forests. But, and before actually learning more about what I wanted to do in my life, it was actually, I could remember a pivotal moment in my life when I was still 13. So this is my dad, and this is a younger version of me. <laughs> that was about 10 years ago on one of my first major mountains. So my dad actually brought me to Mount Kinabalu, which is the tallest mountain in Malaysia. And during that time, I, it was my first time experiencing really something so grand, some, something so different. Because I also grew up in Manila, which is a very big and dense city. And 
in this journey, in growing up, my dad inspired me in a way because he brought me to all these different places. But in this particular mountain, I actually didn't get to reach the summit. I fail in that mountain. And, but that failure actually pushed me to realize, wow, that there's just so much more to explore around the world in Malaysia, in the Philippines, in Southeast Asia, that I told myself when I was 13, that when I turn 18, when I'm legally able to travel, I will find a way to do so. And going up in the mountains and seeing everything change after graduating high school, I got into my university in the University of the Philippines. And getting into university, I realized that I had this kind of independence that I wanted to go into. So I joined organizations, mountaineering organizations, diving organizations that allowed me to explore my own country, the Philippines, and to actually tell more stories about it. And this is when I realized what discovering my passion in the environment, in, in, in nature and photography. Because I honestly didn't have a camera when I was starting out traveling in the Philippines and in the mountains. It was only about like 2016 or four years ago when I got my first camera. And I realized that I wanted to share the, sto the moments that I had with nature, the moments that I had in these places that I visited to document it to document the changes that were happening in my very own country, in my very own backyard. And this passion led me to finding ways that I could learn photography. Because getting into university, I actually am pursuing a civil engineering degree. And people find it so weird how different it is because, you know, like engineering and photography, where is it? What, what do you want to do in your life? And it was this moment when I was actually, when I was just sharing my photos on, on mountains in the Philippines, when a doctor that I, a doctor that I actually also was apparently on the same climb when I was 13, invited me to do an expedition with him in one of the most remote islands in the Philippines called Babuyan Islands. And we were a group of 10 mountaineers who were like living and sailing for about six days in this small boat. And during that time, I had the opportunity to actually finally tell a story to a local agency, a local department. And it was a story about the, the five uncharted volcanoes in Babuyan Islands, in one of the most remote islands in the Philippines. But what's crazy about this trip wasn't just the trip, but actually going back from this expedition. Again, we were sailing on this small boat, on this small boat, when I suddenly received uh, a message and, and that message was like, gab, 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 go check your email, go check your email. And when I checked my email, apparently one of the photo contests, an international photo contest that I actually applied for, which was supported by the Ramsar Convention and Wetlands and was actually published on National Geographic, it was a crazy dream. I wrote a story and took photos about the wetlands in the Philippines. And I never imagined that the risk that I was taking, the opportunities that I was making in university would end up in, in one of the greatest platforms that would tell about natural history. And the prize of this trip was actually that they would, they sent me a list of the Ramsar wetlands of international importance. Basically they sent me all the wetlands around the world and they would fund me and travel and bring me to that place. So I had a list of all the countries from from Argentina, from Chile, from Madagascar. And I couldn't just, Im I couldn't imagine it just being, being a student and being a, a kid, a young kid coming from the Philippines that these opportunities would actually come at hand. So I chose this trip and brought me to this farthest place that I could go to from the Philippines, which was in Argentina and Chile. But in this photo, I never realized how actually a photo could change my life forever, how, a, how photography will change my life forever and inspired me, this moment really inspired me to pursue this career even while balancing academics, even while balancing my school and even balancing my organizations that I was in. And I realized that, okay, that maybe you could actually, that engineering and photography aren't really mutually exclusive things that there's something that I could learn from engineering that I actually could apply to. Because in the Philippines and a lot of parts of Asia, we're very, very conventional and traditional when it comes to acad academics. My parents 
think that photography is just a hobby, that the arts is just a hobby or like a recreational thing that you could go into. They always seem like the, the only way to life is pursuing a degree in law school, in engineering, being a doctor, being a lawyer, and all those professions, but never really saw photography as a way for you to actually explore. And this was my trip in Patagonia, and never in my life would I realize at this point, this happened in early 2018 or in December 2017 to January of 2018. And never in my life would I've actually imagined that I would be brought to these places from the tropical islands of the Philippines to the glacial wetlands and icy, to, uh, icy cap, ice capped mountains of Patagonia. And it brought me more because this opportunity where I took the risk to apply for, for grants, for photo competitions, brought me to mountains in Australia, like this in the tallest mountain in Mount Kosciuszko. And brought me to even like the Mojave Desert in the stars in the US. And I remember always posting Instagram stories about it, like when I have to bring my luggage to your exam room to school, even when I have to catch a flight the next day. And I, my professors would look at me like, why, would it, why, would you, why do you have like a luggage that you would bring to school? And I would even receive messages from some people who would say, you can quit school, you know, you like, you take good books. But I realized that, okay, sure, I had the amazing privilege to be able to actually document and witness these places as a photographer but I knew that there was something lacking because I always had this mindset or idea that my parents or the society that I was living in was pushing me that the only way to life was actually pursuing engineering as a civil engineer and I realized like going out of the four borders of my classroom that in fact engineering and photography aren't really at the two ends of a spectrum. That art and science weren't, science weren't actually at two ends of a spectrum, but integrating this from environmental engineering and photography. Because now I'm working as a conservation photographer talking about environmental issues. And engineering actually tells, uh, tells you about applied solutions that you could actually use in solving these issues that I tell about through visual storytelling. And, being able to leverage this kind of knowledge that I would, the knowledge that I was actually learning from engineering and apply it to the photo stories that I was, um, I was documenting or I was putting uh, through the different magazines or different uh, stories that I was making, I realized that, okay, maybe in this world today, that diversity is our, really our greatest strength. That nowadays, like being a specialist on one thing isn't might not be the right fit because you're always going to be trying to find something different that you're always trying to find some something new and i realized that really diversity being both an engineer and being both a photographer would actually be the greatest thing that i could actually make of myself because this is who i am and this is what makes my identity and my, what makes my national identity i i don't want to become like the greatest photographer out there. I just want to be what I want to do. I want to be what like the, being an engineer, being a photographer, pursuing and following the different paths in my life, may it be in the academic career of science or may it be in through visual storytelling, through photography or filmmaking. And it was this diversity that really allowed me to connect to more stories and the identity that I shared being a Filipino. Because in reality, not a lot in the Philippines, there aren't really any conservation documentary, uh, documentaries or there aren't really filmmakers out there in the local scene in this kind of industry that I'm working in. I never really saw role model models. All my inspirations were like international photographers from National Geographic, from BBC, who were from different parts of the world, who were in the US, in the UK, but not really in Southeast Asia, not really in the Philippines. I remember going to Jackson Wild, one of the, they call it like the Oscars of the natural history filmmaking. And I was overwhelmed with realizing how I was actually one of the only Filipinos out there and the only Southeast Asian there. And most of the stories or documentaries that were being made were about 
our countries about like Philippine Eagle, uh, the tar shears, but it wasn't being done by a Filipino. And I realized that there was this whole gap in this industry, that there's a whole gap in finding this career of mine that I needed to fill, that maybe I could pursue this more into telling stories about the Philippines, the local stories that I find at home from the indigenous communities like the Agusan, where I actually applied for a National Geographic Early Career Grant that got me to tell this story, this beautiful story about the wetlands and advocacy that I was focus, focusing on when through nature photography. And it was an amazing experience that I had being, being able to tell about protecting and conserving this place through solid waste management from what I got in environmental engineering, but as well as being able to artistically and visually show it through the photographs that I took during this project that I was working in. Because in the Philippines, the Philippines is actually one of the deadliest countries. Actually, it's the deadliest country for environmental defenders. So like journalists and photographers are really put at risk in telling these star stories. But I realized the more worth that it is pursuing because there's not really a lot of people telling about this. And like th this was a peat fire or a fire, one of the uh, peat fires that I documented last April during summer in the largest wetland in the Philippines called Agusan Marsh. And people were actually telling me about how nobody knew it, like friends, co colleagues, fellow Filipinos were messaging me and fellow people were actually messaging me how they never saw this in the news and how they don't realize that these things are happening and that they need to, tell, uh, to have these stories more out there. And of course, the youth, the, the children of the marsh, the children that needs to hear these stories, because you know, like, given the opportunities that you have to choose different uh, career careers, I think the goal is really to bringing out, bringing, bring these careers to people who might not have the privilege to choose between engineering or photography or art or science. And like, like a, as a conservation photographer, I found this juxtaposition or like the importance of being able to balance, balance your time, balance the, the things that you have growing up in a career or choosing whatever degree that you want to. Because I realized what, and this story actually just got released uh, in the national, through print in the National Geographic Explorer magazine, which I, I'm really, really grateful for. And I, I never knew that you can be, have, be an engineer and be a photographer at the same time and finally have your story on, you know, the yellow borders, the famed yellow borders that people kind of think is the pinnacle of the things. And growing up and like learning about this all in four years really was really, really fast. And it's only actually now during the pandemic that, was, that I was really able to reflect about the life that we're living or the life that I was able to live and grateful enough to live that really it's all about the risk that you take during, during your early career that you should be really going out there, fail, keep on failing, keep on pitching, keep writing grants, keep joining photo contests, um, study your homework, go take those exams, even if you have a flight the next day, because, you know, it's all worth it. And I've always had this quote, like, you only, it's not you only live once, but you only die once. And you have to live every day of your life to the fullest. Because being an explorer, even becoming a National Geographic explorer, is just to be human. It's just to really be different, to have your own identity whatever career that you want to go to may be in the arts, may be in the sciences. If you want to be a lawyer, you could actually have the, and you have an advocacy for the environment. You could be an environmental lawyer. The world is your platter. Like you really have the opportunity to choose and explore. And being an explorer isn't just about like traveling to Patagonia or traveling to these swamps or uncharted volcanoes, but it's about really pushing yourself to the limits of your own potential to, to discover the things that you want to become or what your vision is, what you want to change through the world, the problems that you have in your own country or the problems that you face in your classroom that you want to learn and apply to the real world. Because, and this is what really pushed me into developing this career and really continuing to inspire and be inspired through the, the life that you live, that you want to push and become a photographer, not just because to take beautiful photographs, 
but really to push an advocacy or fight a problem that we're all facing, that your, your family or your locals are facing, your local community is facing. And I always believe in this philosophy that whenever you choose that you never let what you do become who you are. I think for some, a lot of people think that, okay, maybe getting published in National Geographic is the biggest thing that you could get. But I realize that this shouldn't be like the pinnacle. The pinnacle is to always be evolving, to always be creating, to always be choosing different paths and carving your own path. Just not just because you have it early, um, you 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 want to try to explore more. And now I'm I'm leveraging into more natural history filmmaking, going into documentary, going into uh, long form documentaries because I always want to. I've always had the same passions and advocacy, but I'm just trying to evolve more into different forms of where I can use this in building the career that I have. And now I want to transition into motion, into documentaries and movies and films and being able to tell that story. And I realized that having the start, this passion that I had when I was 13, that, okay, I always remember that moment that I failed in that mountain because that was a moment that I, I, I kind of had a, I was grateful for that knowing what you want to become at a very young age or knowing how to like put yourself or like shoot, find the opportunities and decisions of what you want. And it's honestly a hard task. A lot of people think that it's easy choosing the path that you want to become or like you have to do a lot of research. You have to have endless, endless, like right now it's 2 a.m. here in the Philippines and you know, you got to sacrifice a lot of your time and effort in pushing for that dream of yours, for that whatever career that you want to go to. And because sooner or later, it, it will pay off. It will pay off in the end. And I remember like even now in COVID, like it's, it's a really tough time. And sometimes I feel like maybe I'm not doing enough. I'm not uh, creating what I'm supposed to create or I'm, I feel lost in what I, I, what I do. Because I do get that sometimes even... I do get it every, uh, most of the times, actually, maybe once a month. And I, I realize that, okay, it's, it's part of a process. It's a part of, of, it's part of growth that you feel like, um, like you're not doing something that you, you care for and like you're not really pushing yourself to, you, to your best. And that's when I, I realized that, okay, maybe what, what is this? What am I missing? What am I losing? Like, what am I trying to find, actually? And I remember getting this message one day when I was really feeling at the lowest that my work wasn't getting out there. I'm not doing enough as a photographer. I'm kind of failing my exams in engineering. And then I, I got this message out of nowhere, like, oh, hi, like, oh, I'm from the Philippines and I'm such a fan of your passion and your craft. I also aspire to be a professional photographer someday. I feel so delighted whenever I see your photos, especially during my chemotherapy. Your photos helped me so much in my journey. And it was one of the most touching messages that I realized. And I realized that, okay, maybe being a photographer that in life, in this journey and the career that we want to build to, it's not really about just finding purpose. I, I don't, I realize that it's not really about finding your purpose because you can't find something if you don't know what you're looking for, right? And I realize it's about being purposeful, about where you are right now. You have to evaluate what you can do the tools that you have, the, the things that were given to you and what you could make the most out of it. Your identity as your own citizen from being a Filipino or whatever citizen, whatever country you're from, then reevaluating yourself, what was given to you that you could use to be made useful for others. And how, this is what led me to this passion in photography and how I could use the photographs and the knowledge that I get from engineering to, I don't know, bring it to the kids and educate kids about the, the stories that we have in the Philippines that the people who have not, no privilege of seeing these videos, these films, or seeing, um, seeing the mountains or the, the, the wetlands. And I realized that, yeah, this is it. This is like the career that I'm gonna choose in the next, I don't know, years until I die. Because <laughs> this is the community that you built. You're not just building yourself in your career. You're supposed to be building a community with it. So thank you so much. And that's <laughs> the end of my presentation. My goodness, Gab, I'm 
I'm not at all exaggerating when I say that my jaw was on the floor every single time you shared a new photo. I mean, you honestly have such a talent, not just for photography, but for creating images that go a step further. They capture the essence of storytelling and of exploration. But it's not just for yourself. Like, as you mentioned, I, what I find really valuable and inspiring, particularly for young people like us, is that you very intentionally take the time out of your day to share your experiences and help others along the way. Um, and speaking of others, before we let others hop into our discussion, Gav, I also want to make sure that we're including our audience in this experience. So to those of you at home, we'd love to hear from you. So share your thoughts by tagging at Nat Geo Education. Use the hashtag GenGeo on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever social media platform you prefer. And be sure to submit any questions you have through the chat bar, and we'll address them as they're submitted. But Gab, you know, let's hop right into it. You know, you mentioned a little bit earlier in your presentation, but for the, the first time you really knew that photography and engineering was something you wanted to do for the rest of your life was when you were just 13. This is like your first major hike in Malaysia. Can you describe that moment to us a little bit more? And of all the pathways you could have taken in life, why did this one speak out to you the most? I think being a very nostalgic a person, I realized like, okay, it's not just the 13 year old Gab that was speaking. Like, I like growing up, I realized that there are other 13 year olds out there who might have experienced this mountain and would want to see it one day in the future and take those moments with it. And like right now, especially with like the degradation that's happening and the climate crisis and everything, I think like it was really a pivotal moment that I have to dedicated my career, dedicate my career um, to this because I want other kids to experience the same thing through whatever they saw before through photography. Right. And I mean, on that journey, you had to decide it when you were 12 to climb the seven summits. That is such an audacious idea. Um, and to some, a goal that might be completely overwhelming. So how did you take this huge career goal of yours and kind of break it down into smaller, more manageable accomplishments and milestones. How do you strategically go about achieving something so grand? I think I always look, look at like a 10 year plan. I call it a 10 year plan. So I usually like envision what I'm, what I want in the 10th year, then have all these nine years with me. And like, I never realized that it could happen and within like, especially like becoming a National Geographic explorer and contributing to National Geographic. We're climbing uh, different mountains around the world. It was just like, okay, I want to conquer it. I want to climb the seven summits. I want to be a National Geographic explorer. I want to be a contributing photographer for National Geographic. I had these as like the top goals that I had, but in the nine years I said, okay, I'm going to join a photo club. I'm going to join a mountaineering club in the Philippines. I had these small steps that I, I needed to go first before having that big goal. And I think that 10 year plan really helped me, you know, like keep me on track, whatever, where, where I was going at. Cause like at 13, honestly, at, at that age, I was like still, you know, kind of distracted with everything from like playing games or whatever, or like doing sports or whatnot. Right. Like, but I, I knew, like, I just pinned on it, like, when I was thinking, okay, I'm going to travel the world, and, like, who are these people who are traveling the world? And I realized, okay, these are, like, photographers, these are writers, um, mountaineers, explorers, and that's where I really got hooked. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I, when you're talking about something you really want to do for the rest of your life, your dream job, the way I define it is that you find something you absolutely love to do and then get paid to follow that passion. So what steps did you take to transform your passion for mountaineering and photography into a professional and funded endeavor by National Geographic? I really had to do a lot of things for free at the, at the start, right? Before even getting on the first assignment or getting a grant. Like I volunteered in different organizations like WWF, UN, in different um, ways that I could actually use my photography. So I contributed photographs on 
local government um, and different organizations like, yeah, WWF, and which actually I think a really paved, like creating that portfolio that I have. And that's where I realized, okay, maybe your work is out there now and maybe your work is substantial and is significant that you could apply for, for, for more projects that could actually be developed into a career. Because I know it's a tough job actually being a photographer, especially in the Philippines or like in some parts of the world where photography is kind of looked or the arts are really looked down on. So I really had to build this, um, build this portfolio and portfolio of work that I needed to show. Yeah, let's dive into that portfolio then a, a little bit deeper. I mean, how did you even learn the skills of photography to streamline your mission? Was it through like a trial and error process? You just went out in your backyard to take classes. You know, how in the world do you build kind of your technical foundation for this? Well, actually, I didn't have a camera. I only got my camera in 2016. And I still remember it at that time. But I would always borrow from my siblings or my cousins whenever I had like a mountaineering trip. And I would always bring my camera with me wherever I go, like just take photos of anything from trees, birds, the mountains, and my small camping trips that I would have with my organizations. Then I would just really like push and push and push. Like even if I had classes, the, the like one Wednesday I remember I was having I had classes until like 5 p.m and I would ride the jeepney or like a commute to a mountain nearby that's like an, two hours away and just be alone and like take photos of the st stars and learn about astrophotography I would go into YouTube and learn astrophotography search like how to take photos of stars in astrophotography and I would just try to apply it when I'm when I after classes and go out of my way then going back again the next day when I have classes on Thursday on 8 a.m. I remember doing this a lot and like I, sometimes I would be alone because nobody wants to go with me because <laughs> it's like too late at night but but I think I had a lot of mentors as well a really really great mentors along the way that taught me not just in photography I had like a mentor in mountaineering I had a mentor in um, engineering I had a mentor in film and I'm, I had a mentor in writing like I had all these different mentors that I would actually try to get uh, to learn from and gain knowledge from not just the technical aspects, but even like the mental aspects of things. Cause like you have to develop composition and you have to have that kind of mindset where, especially if you're climbing a, a huge mountain to, to not give up, like those, that those things actually integrated, I guess, into the work that I was doing. Like, okay, whenever I'm writing an, are doing an exam or, or like whenever I'm learning photography, I would say, this is, like a, this is just like a mountain. You're not supposed to give up, <laughs> okay? You're like not supposed to go back down the trail. You, I had, I kind of like implanted this mindset from the mountaineering aspect to, the, to photography. And like this love for nature, for the advoc advocacy of nature, I think that fueled also my passion and my career track, my career track in professional photography because this is what I want to love and it is what I love to protect and this is what I, I love. So love seeing and love, uh, love being in. And I guess that really pushed my career track more. Yeah, and it's just so much more than just photography, right? Like, as you mentioned, it's a mindset, you're sharing stories, narratives, they really go beyond just a single image. Um, and to that, your ability to share these stories, either through TED Talks or news articles, I think is almost as important as taking the pictures themselves. So can you chat a little bit more about why you decided to get involved in public speaking? What topics have you discussed? And why is going the extra step through storytelling important to you? I think there's always this natural barrier, especially when photography, especially just seeing it on a phone that you have to tell these stories intimately to get that, that real connection in, in order for you to, like, for example, protect the place. You have to be lobbying to politicians. You have to be um, working with um, environmental rangers. And if you don't know how to talk or like speak their language or communicate the stories that needs to be heard or told, I think there would be a growth, there would be a disconnect. And like building, learning, learning to communicate with, different um, sectors or stakeholders was an important thing in conservation photography 
because you're not just taking photos again of like animals, wildlife, you're here to give a voice to them. And you know, like animals can't speak, right? So like you have the ability to tell these important stories of people who are not being heard of, of wildlife who are being brought to the brink of extinction. So you really have the duty as a photographer to tell these stories to people who need to hear them. Because even if we think like we're all living in a bubble, like not a lot of people, if you think that you're, um, if you're like even posting on social media or like sharing stories on Instagram or Twitter, it, you're, we're all living in this kind of bubble and we need to get out of this bubble to, to really learn, to really be able to actually bring your advocacy forward. And you've done so much in this short amount of time. And I keep having to remind myself that you're still in your early 20s. But as exciting as that sounds, I'm really wondering if age really ever played a factor in establishing your credibility. You know, were you ever told that you were too young for this work? I think, yeah, that's, that's really true. Because like here also in the Philippines and some parts of Asia, seniority has always been played a big role in our culture and tradition that that if you're like older you're always right but you know it's it's a tough job it's a tough job and life out there but I I just use this actually as a form of more motivation that okay I need to we're part of this new generation like we're we're a whole generation who will be actually um experiencing the consequences of your decisions or your actions of your teachings for the older generation and we need to speak out more. And I think that really just pushed me more. Like being young shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be a hindrance to whatever you're doing. Sure, I could, like, I, when I <laughs> remember when I was 13, like, okay, at 18, I would find a way to do so because when I'm legally able to travel, right? I think that, that kind of like mindset also on like choosing that age would never be a hindrance to your dreams and your passions is so important and you could actually as a youth you have so much passion and energy you're always curious and you want to explore I think this really helped a lot because you know this is where where curiosity brings out and where we could really be explorers absolutely and you're also immersed in the adult world as well because you're a contributor for the Manila Times which is incredible among other things like you're addressing the important role of activism and you're suggesting responses to global crises like the pandemic you know why is it so important for you to craft and speak your own narrative and how did you learn the skills to write effectively and persuasively I think it's really important especially like right now youth is a big population a big majority of the population around the world and we're not being heard like you, you look at the newspaper and all those who are writing the columnists are all, you know, like from a different generation, from the older generation. And it's like, why aren't we important? Like we, being a youth is so important, especially in changing in the world or like being a progressive society. And I think um, with like going through the, the craft of writing, I've always had this passion with writing and photography as well. Cause like I, like I wanted to tell stories through more than through photos. And like learning this um, craft was a really tough uh, experience, I guess, because in the Philippines as well, like English wouldn't be particularly be like the first language that we have. And I, learning this and as well as like applying this in a way that I could speak to a greater audience was so important. So like learning how to write effectively is so important into bringing change. Because you need to, again, like as a conservationist, as in working for the environment, you're working with different communities, you're working with politicians, you're working with different sectors of businesses and industries, and you need to communicate effectively as a storyteller. And communication is the key, like being able to comprehend each other would be a key. So I think that really drove me, drove me into learning how to write I'm going to put you on the spot here for a little bit. So let's say that I, I asked you to write an article today about any topic. What would it most likely be about and why? Wow. <laughs> I think, 
um, if there was any, I think I was actually writing, supposed to write this week for the, the Manila Times. And I, I'm, I kind of have this topic in mind about politics and geopolitics, basically how in the Philippines, we all have this kind of problem in the pandemic because of the geographical barriers that we have, like, especially like how not a lot of people realize it from different cultures and different languages that we have in the Philippines, that this causes a, a gap between our national identity. And because not a lot of people have this identity, this national identity that they have, they kind of find different political avenues to choose from, which causes like wrong decisions by the government or like wrong support in uh, facing the pandemic. No, super interesting. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I found also very aspirational about your work, Gab, is the fact that you not only focus on your own goals and your own purpose, but you really think critically about, okay, how can I bring others along the way with me? And so in my eyes, I mean, that's the true testament to leadership. And, you know, as you're taking charge in this movement, what do you think the biggest challenge is that's facing a lot of young change makers now globally? I think they're, they're really afraid to fail, that not a lot of people realize that failure is really the grow, where you can learn and grow. Like right now, we kind of had this mindset of perfection, of being a perfect or else you're going to get called out or else you're going to be canceled in the internet or whatever, right? Like everyone tries to be perfect. And this kind of leads them to not taking risks again and finding initiatives for opportunities or find, like for grants, for photo contests. They're not really putting themselves out there because they're afraid to fail. And I think we have to get like this, this, this disillusionment on perfection that we, we have to go out of this barrier and go out of our comfort zones. Like I've said, like to be an explorer, you don't have to climb different mountains or go to far reaches and places. You just have to be human and embrace that that you're young, that you're, you're, you can be passionate, that there's still so much out there that you could go into. Yeah, and, and on the longer career journey, I can only imagine that you have faced so many failures and challenges. Can you describe one of those moments for us that just seemed absolutely insurmountable? You know, what was the closest that you ever came to giving up? And most importantly, how did you get past it? I think one of the biggest failures I had was like, I, I remember like, really applying for um, for this pitch. I was pitching for a story and I failed. Like I, I, I kept sending the editors, but none of them wanted to. Like, I, I think I made like, I don't know, 40, 40 pitches. And I failed every single one of them. I said like, okay, that's it. I, I think, I don't think I could be a, a natural history filmmaker. But there was this one, one person who particularly uh, sent me this, um, application for like this program for natural history filmmaking and I realized okay like I never like one per like 39 people could fail you but like this one person who believes in you would help you out and like realize that okay you actually have potential so I think like that that was a really really big failure because I wanted to quit that time like okay maybe I'm not good enough I, I always have these doubts in myself like this kind of imposter syndrome that I get that you're, you're, that you're not cut out because like, honestly, there's no, there are no role models even to look up to as a Filipino. Like you kind of feel alone in this journey, but you know, if there's one person who believes in you, might as well take that chance and keep going on. Oh, wonderful. You know, let's pretend for a moment, Gab, that you're back in your teenage years, um, with all this experience in mind, what advice would you give your past self? Like, is there anything you would have done differently? You know, what would you have told yourself if you could go back a couple of years? I would have told myself to keep on doing what you're doing. I think like live life with no regrets, no regrets at all. I think anything, I mean, just keep doing what you're doing, keep failing on what you're failing, like keep on failing, keep on growing. Like, I wouldn't change anything in my past life, anything. Or, like, I think the whole journey, the whole climb of this life was 
is it also is a, it has been a great experience so far and i know that there will always be bad days there will be steep climbs there will be tough tough times but just keep on going just keep on climbing oh for sure and and with that being said i mean i'd love to take the time to ask questions from the audience so I'm not sure if you can see, but we have members coming from Argentina, Venezuela, Brazil, Malaysia, the US, and parts of New York, New Jersey, Arizona, Colorado. We have a whole global audience listening in today. Um, so we're just going to hop in and some of their questions. So um, Tommy from Argentina wants to know specifically, you know, how did you start as a Nat Geo Explorer? And then what are some of the benefits and, and the pluses that you see from being part of the National Geographic community? So you can actually be a National Geographic Explorer by applying for a grant. So I actually got a grant through the National, an early career grant in storytelling and conservation. And I think the biggest, so I don't know if there, there's still links and I don't know if the applications are still up because of the pandemic. So I'm not pretty sure about that, but, but yeah, I think the greatest thing that I learned, I got it through National Geographic was being part of this community of, researchers, of scientists, of explorers and artists, of storytellers that I could see myself in and I could be, really learn and connect with and like grow as a, as in throughout my career. I think that was really the greatest thing that you could get as that sense of community. And it's the greatest investment that you could make at a young age. Absolutely. Um, another question coming right in is from Jesus. He asks, now, what would you say to young people who are not supported to follow their dreams to become a photographer, you know, especially by community members, parents, or family? The more that you're supposed to do it, honestly. <laughs> like, as me, I, I like, um, my parents would sometimes tell me, like, oh, even, like, getting published with National Geographic, they would tell me, like, this is not, this is still not the right, you still have to become an engineer or something like that. I would get like nagged by my mom <laughs> about like, why are you traveling again? But they don't realize that it's work. Like you, you actually get paid for it and that they don't realize the experience that you get in it. And this is what makes me happy. And why would I choose that away? Because of someone else telling me that, even if it's by blood, even if it's someone close to me, I, I realize that it's me who's going to define my life. It's not my family who's going to define it for me. So I think the more that people are telling you to go out of their way, you can always like negotiate, negotiate your way in. Like there are times when, especially like, like, okay, you have a family meeting or like a family a thing that you have to, but you have this important trip that you go to, you kind of try to negotiate in a way that you, you get to fulfill your family time as well as your, your, your career time. Because it's really about balance of fulfillment. Yeah. And about your your passion for travel, Tommy's also curious, and she asked, you know, what's your dream trip? Wow. Um, I think my dream trip is. I think it's already been done because I I was working on it in a story in uh, the the project that I was working on in the Philippines and the largest wetlands. I think that was the, the my dream trip. And having that story out recently, really, I don't know, it's just so overwhelming. But I think if there was any place that I could go to, I would want to definitely go to Antarctica. <laughs> I think that would be a really cool different place from the beaches and uh, hot, hot Manila. You and me both. If you go to Antarctica, take me with you. I, I, I'd be so excited to go visit Antarctica. Um, so, and along those similar lines, uh, Kotoko is asking, you know, if you had to live in the most photogenic place, where would it be? Wow. Uh, well, it depends on what kind of environment that you want. But if, if it was in the mountains, I would want to live in Switzerland, I guess. But if it's in the islands, Philippines. <laughs> Sounds good. I mean, either one of those sound absolutely beautiful. We're putting it on the bucket list as soon as quarantine is over. Um, yeah. On a more serious note, Sarah is asking, you know, what advice would you give for people that don't have a lot of natural resources in their home to experiment with, but they want to be a nature photographer? I would, don't have the natural subjects? Mm -hmm. Or, what do you mean? okay. Well, really... Photography is a very big genre, and I think 
you could really explore more into different fields of photography. And if you, you know, there's not a lot of like nature and you're really, you're really passionate about nature, you could actually, I know, I know people who are working on like stories about urban nature, you know, like finding, finding new, new, new ways in how you could, or new angles on how you could take photos of what, what the animals that live nearby your city. Because like in, con in photography, really it's about getting different frames and perspectives, right? So I think that would be one way. Or I think if there's not really any nature, you really, I think it's hard, it's really difficult but you could actually maybe go on even if it's ours away. If you're really, if you really love to see nature and take photos of it, you might, you could find a way to get to those places. Well, sounds great. And I mean, let's focus the conversation also on where you're going and where you've been. So I also have to remind myself that you still have time in the day to be in university right now. So how is that going? What are you studying? And is it difficult to find a balance between your work and studies? Well, right now there's no school because of the pandemic. So, but actually in January, before they actually shut out school, shut down school. Um, yeah, I had a production we were working on a production on, on a stories and I would have to take my exams online and I would, or sometimes I would have to take my exams early, like a week early before it gets re uh, released to this. Yeah. I think I, I kind of lucky enough also that the professors like I allow me to take exams early or like get to leave off school because I, I showed them like documents as well and contracts that, okay, I'm working student. And I think for them, they understand the work that you do and being, making, um, giving them like sharing your side that, okay, this is, I'm not just like skipping school because um, I'm like going to a bar or something like that. Uh, like I, I, I have to do work and this is, uh, th this gives me a living and, you know, like there are ways that you can negotiate and sometimes like in balancing my schedule, uh, I have to really, really like really like dedicate so much time and sacrifice studying the whole night even if you're on a plane on a bus I would bring my notebooks from school my my engineering books I would put it on my phone like download the pdf of an engineering book and just put it in my phone and just study scrolling while on a flight or a trip and a bus so there are like ways that you could learn even if and learn about these things you are the As king well. of multitasking that it <laughs> seems so you know, it, this is obviously something very difficult to keep up and you probably were on the online schooling trend long before any of us were, but you know, what do you see with the value of education? Ultimately, what do you hope to do with your college degree? I really hope for it to be as a new leeway or like um, as a new kind of like field to explore in engineering because like environmental engineering isn't really as well topped on in the Philippines, even, we, even if we're like one of, one of a plentiful natural resources in one of the mega biodiverse countries in the world, environmental engineering hasn't really been established here. And it's a, it's a great opportunity as like getting these conservation knowledge from National Geographic, being a, a nature photographer, I also get to apply that to my engineering and not just the other way around. So I, I really hope that I could I could be able to shift this um, or like lead this way in this degree or like this engineering course, this field in engineering in the Philippines. Really cool. Um, in the very beginning of this conversation, I asked you, you know, what's your strategy for breaking down huge goals? And you said, I have a 10 year plan. So I'm going to flip that question right back on you. What is your 10 year plan now? Okay. So actually my 10 year plan is to create a blue chip documentary or like a BBC documentary about Philippine endangered animals. I think that was a, a great uh, goal that I want to in the future. And right now I'm actually on that third year of that 10 year plan. And we actually are in pre-production. So I think that was a really, really great start to work on for like a European broadcast, European broadcasters. That is 
incredibly exciting. Well, I hope that it comes out soon. I'll be the first one to watch it for sure. Um, and I think that brings me to the question is, you know, what does your work look like now amidst the pandemic? And what about young people that want to enter this field? How should we prepare in the upcoming months? Yeah, right now it's actually been so tough because there's not a lot of opportunities for you to go out on assignment or go out on the field. And I've really been like really landlocked here in the Philippines. We have lockdowns everywhere. And it's, 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 and like the risk that you have as well of getting sick if you're on the field, you, you have to be thinking about that. But, you know, I've been working mainly online now, creating online articles, contributing to online platforms and trying to make use of the photographs that I had before and actually creating new stories that I could work with. And it's been good so far. I'm really, really grateful and lucky to not be in a position where it's, I have to survive, like I have to get the next meal a day or something like that. And I know a lot of people here in our country who are experiencing that. And, but, but yeah, I think the next few years, travel would really change as well as photography would also change. And I think it's a way for you to be more creative. It's actually a really great time for you to explore more kind of genres and more fields. If you can't be on the forest, why, why don't you be in the street and tell a story about COVID or be about the sto- tell about story about the plight of your own country or your, your city of how they're dealing with the crisis. I think it's, it's a great opportunity for us now to explore new avenues of where you could bring this creative juices that you have. Like if you're, you, you want to learn new techniques or new, a new kind of platform or tools, go on to YouTube, go, make vlogs, go on to TikTok or whatever, like be creative in a way. I think just being able to create would change definitely. It's not going to be the same as it was before, but you know, the same creativity that you have, it's still going to remain the same. So just find new ways and avenues for it. And and you beat me to my next question. I was going to ask you, what's one way we can all be involved from home? And it seems like you already have a huge (laughs) array of suggestions for us. So thank you for that. Um, One of my final questions for you, Gab, is how in the world do we stay informed about the work that you're doing after this session ends? Like if you are doing some incredible work for documentaries, how can we keep up with you? Well, actually, one of my main platforms is in uh, Instagram. So you can you can check out at Gab Mejia. So it's just my first name and full name. That's where I mostly put out all the work or the assignments or like behind the scenes production. So yeah, and I have a website. It's on dash the dash climb.com. It's actually a mountaineering website. But like I made a photo stories, some of the photo stories, but I'm still revamping the website. You'll definitely have a couple of viewers from this, myself included, after all the incredible photographs that you shared. Uh, but Gap, thank you so, so, so much for your time. It was such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Sahar. It's just a great discussion and a great talk. It was so nice to reconnect with you as well today. You know, it's like last year was so long ago, but it's so nice to see you here. <laughs> I know, I know. Hopefully we'll see each other again in person soon. Um, and also thank you guys for all for watching. So please continue to share your thoughts and tag at Nat Geo Education or use hashtag Gen Geo on any social media platform. If you're available this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, you have to join the photo camp live session that's focused on using photography to express emotions and abstract concepts. So you can directly take all the suggestions that Gab made and put them into use with Nat Geo photographers, Matthew and Danielle to help you out. If you've not checked out these sessions, you're really, really missing out guys. Also mark your calendar for next week. Tuesday, July 21st from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. So you can join me for a conversation with Ingi Menhus, where we'll be talking about her international heritage, dissatisfaction with the current narratives on migration, and what she decided to do about it with National Geographic through education and storytelling. This is a conversation you definitely don't want to miss. So go ahead and register it for it now online. But until then, thanks for joining us and stay curious.